And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Bench with Bubba, episode 614. The Return of the King is here to discuss some um, MLB hot stuff because I've been doing other shows and stuff. So we have literally all the info since the beginning of November to discuss if we want some will obviously be kind of just cliff notes. There are some more impactful ones. Winter meetings are taking place as we record here on Tuesday. And so hopefully there'll be a lot more to talk about uh, as the week goes on, as there's quote unquote rumors everywhere. But to help me break that down, like I said, is one of my kind of co-hosts during the regular season, the recap fab, uh, probably back this year, unless something crazy happens. You know, his, his, his philosophy on content changes all the time. He is now going to be doing MLBPlayingTime.com, which is supposed to be released in January or February. But for those keeping track at home, it was released on Monday, December 4th. So that says a lot about the individual that I love and call a friend over here. You can find him on Twitter at Mike underscore Curlin. Mike Curlin, how are we doing, my friend? I feel attacked. <laughs> <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, I've been thinking about what how to open this show since yesterday when you opened your website. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where uh, I, I was I had so much. I just I wanted to write about all the rumors, all the like, but not not so much the rumors, but like, hey. Jonathan India is going to first base. How does that affect the whole team? And I find that interesting. So I want to write about it. And, and then I, so I wrote something. I was like, I'm just, by the time I release the site, this is useless information. And then the Mets thing, hey, they're not going to go in, according to the president of operations, the Mets aren't going to go look for a third baseman. Cool. Let's look at their options internally. We kind of know them, but let's break it down, see what they produced last year, et cetera, et cetera. And I find this information just personally very interesting. And I wanted to put it. And that's the type of stuff I want to be able to do in the offseason is react to these. Again, those are rumors, I guess, but those have more validity to them than, hey, where Otani might have washed his dog last Wednesday. Who knows? And uh, that's what we're hearing. You know, so I'm sick of that. So I wanted to put out something that's actually, uh, for me, interesting. Because, again, this whole thing, and I will talk about uh, we talk about why I'm even doing the site, if anybody cares. But uh, So, it's, yeah, it's MLBPlayingTime.com because, obviously, it's my niche. GTE, no mas. So we went our separate ways, it, respectfully. No one's, it's no animosity. Obviously, we're still working together here doing this, but uh, we still have a things, chat that we talk all the time. Man. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those things where it's uh, I still wanted to do this, but because I am scaling back, I know the idea of running a website isn't scaling back, but it really is more like a personal blog. So it kind of is scaling back. And I'm going to be doing seven, you know, like you, you were there, you saw I was doing like what four or five uh, write ups a week on all 30 teams. Like that just, it was too, it was not only was it redundant in a sense, it was just so much. And I'm going to scale way back. And now, and because I'm scaling so far back, especially on the in season stuff, I couldn't justify charging people the same price when I'm planning on doing so much less. So I decided to create my own little thing just because I enjoy content. And I understand as a player in high stakes these days, I doing this doesn't benefit me. It's people, I've had people tell me, like, hey, you're helping people potentially beat you. And I'm like, I get that. And you know me, I've told you my struggles being in it. And now that I've entered the high stakes realm and I really want to compete, being op overly open with my thought processes or open, not so much with thought processes or strategy, but players I'm in on. So that's why I decided to start something. Like, I can still talk about playing time, be not biased. And no one has any idea who I like or don't like just because I'm putting out the, I'm still going to put out very useful information, but in a different way, not so much like, Hey, these are my guys. I'm not planning my flag. You'll know the day before opening day when I post my percentages, who I'm in on other than glass. Now I've been very obviously open about being in on glass now, but it's okay, folks. I'll poke the bear and try to get as much information out of him as possible. I'll still give it. I know. I'm just kidding. It's just um, not as not going to be as uh, willing at all. It's one of those things where I'm trying to keep a little bit of stuff close to the chest, but I'm still pretty much an open book. I'm not going to be like Justin Mason, who has no problem telling you everything, and I, and I respect that. I thought I'd never get to this. I feel kind of crappy being this way, but when I'm I'm putting thousands of dollars of my own money on the line now, so why I don't uh, and because I'm not getting paid for my content. That was a big thing. I'm not getting paid. I'm not obligated to share every little thing about what I'm into, what I'm into in terms of fantasy baseball. That's fine. <laughs> you do you, boo. Um, again, you can find him on Twitter. I'm Mike. Yeah. Yeah. I'm at BD. I have a sub stack going as well. So go check that out. It's all free. Free. free? Oh, free. Yes. It's full all free. circle, Bubba. First, yeah. full people, circle. People are donating money, which is cool and appreciate it, but it's all free. So yeah, do, I'm going to. I'm going to put a link for donations for people who want to yeah. just because just because the startup costs for me are going to be roughly 600 bucks total for the whole year. So if I can just even break even on donations, that'd be fantastic. But I haven't even asked for any. I'm not I'm not, I'm not going to ask. I'm, not, I'm just going to well, put I'm a not link either. It's just a link on the site. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, generous to 
to do. Substack puts the link there without even me doing. It. Oh no, I have to. I'm gonna create a link. I have to, but uh, like I said, it's it's one of those things where I'm putting my own money into it. I don't care. It's it's a hobby. I enjoy this. But anyway, enough about that. People came for. Con- I guess it's off season. We have time to ramble for once, right? Am I sounding okay again? My mic got unplugged for a second. Oh, I you sound good to me. My mic wasn't even connected. You didn't tell me. I just happened to catch it right before we started. It was oh, my uh, camera audio. Well, now it is, but it was my camera audio the first time before. All right. So this is fun technical stuff, as you people <laughs> understand. It's it's what we do here. But let's talk some hot stove goodies mm. here, because I know we'll go down rabbit holes as usual as we do on on and off the air. And um, Curlin will bring his his twist to it. But yeah, like he mentioned. Like I'm with them, the India stuff. Like it's just a rumor, but if you can beat the the rumor mill on these kind of things, that's like Mookie Betts full time second baseman next year. Well, that kind of makes things that we'll talk about Jason Hayward later and some other things that take place in LA. So let's kind of go. I, I kind of instead of going in like chronological order, I kind of grouped them by the teams that maybe benefited from the deals. I guess I don't know, but eventually majority of the deals will be talked about on this show. So we're starting with the Atlanta Braves because they've been super active. It's almost like Jerry DePoto was in Atlanta for a while, and now he's back in Seattle. It's a weird dynamic. But the Braves have been active by just gutting the 40-man roster because maybe they have an idea of spending money this year because they have tons of it. But we'll start with the first trade they made. They traded Kyle Wright and his bum shoulder to the Kansas City Royals for Jackson Coar, who (laughs) will be traded again soon. So we'll talk about him. But I guess we'll start with this. Wright's essentially out for the year unless I missed something. So it's kind of just a wash trade, right? Yeah, Wright's out for the year. So, so we're good there. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just highlighting these things, especially the Jackson Coar part, because he will be back. Um, the next move. This was one that stood out as the total let's clear up space. The White Sox move with the Braves. The Braves traded Mike Soroka, who supposedly is going to be good to go to start the season. Jared Schuster, Nicky Lopez, Braden Schumacher, who was at one point almost the starting shortstop uh, last year for the Braves, and Riley Goins to the White Sox for Aaron Bummer. Do any of those Bra- uh, Braves players going to Chicago who are desperate for any pulse, pretty much, does any of them stand out to you as potential fantasy viable players? Only really the deepest of formats. Um, the name that came to mind for me was Brand- Brandon Schumacher. Uh, is it, I, I thought it was Schumacher. If it's Schumacher, maybe it is. Like, you know me in pronunciation. I think yeah. I just have fun with it, so I'm going to say Schumacher. And if someone has a problem with it, <laughs> and, another and, and the only reason why I think he might be fantasy viable is because obviously I don't believe in De Young really working out or Nicky Lopez, and that leaves guys like. Um, What's his face? There's a few names here, actually. Unfortunately, it's, it's kind of crowded with mediocrity. And Schumach is known for his glove. Last I checked, I haven't looked into him in a, in a little bit of time. But so if Schumach is known for his glove, and obviously they seem to be interested in glove first players if they're going after De Young and Lopez, maybe Schumach gets that first shot instead of a um, what's his face Montgomery that everyone's yes, like, hyped also up. Montgomery. He's, so this might they're, hurt. They're him. hoping he's yeah. They're hoping these guys are just like like kind of stepping stones for Colson. And I think Colson gets up this year, but I think everyone expects him to be up sooner than later. He's going to be 22 at the start of the year. The White Sox have nothing to play for. And these days, I feel like the big question mark is if you're not starting them up with the team to go for that rookie of the year, you know, the extra comp pick, then they're probably just going to play service time games. I don't think there's any in between. You know, like what's what do you gain from bringing a guy up early if you're not going to bring him up right away? Like unless you really think he can still make a push. So it's one of those things where – I haven't. We haven't really seen the White Sox have rookies of late. I feel like like, like guys like yeah. Lenin Sosa and like there was hype around those guys last year, and they never they barely came up. And when they did, it was for injury replacements and other stuff. For it was wild. So I think that um, Schumacher probably and he's on the forty man. For what it's worth, again, these, I know the forty man isn't what it used to be. Like they make room for guys like Colson Montgomery, but Schumacher on the forty man, Montgomery not. That's another path of like resistance, possibly. So maybe they want to, maybe they'll give him runs. So I think DeYoung and Lopez, between injury or failure, won't last very long. And Schumach is the only name of like that really came to mind of like potential upside. I guess Schuster. I mean, obviously, I say Sch- Schuster. Schuster's yeah. the guy that I was like, thinking hitting, you know, in a, in, in a deep, deep format. Schuster, like it wasn't great for Jared Schuster last year. Obviously, there's like coming out of spring training, there's high expectations for Schuster and um, Smith Shaver. And none of them really like found their their full go, but you know, in fifty two innings, he made eleven starts, ERA of five eight one, not ideal, of course. And seventy nine minor league innings, five oh one ERA. But you know, previous regimes were pretty solid. So the dude's only 24, 20, 25 next year or this twenty twenty four season, 
and they really have no reason not to give him run unless it's completely horrific. That's the thing. So, um, like, am I running to draft him? No, but if we're doing a 50 team DC potentially, he's innings, be, <laughs> he's yeah, innings he, at the end. <laughs> you wouldn't be shocked if he's just hanging out. Like, I'm gonna pull up, uh, you know, I should have had these up already, but if you're looking at uh, draft champions drafts so far this season, a guy like Schuster has an ADP of 711. So, really not costing you much. Anything. So it's almost like the store where you just kind of go there for convenience, but you don't really need anything. You just yes, kind of, pretty much. <laughs> the ADP it's matches great, the player. Got it. Great, great point right there. So, yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. Soroka is a broken man. I need to see a lot before I get But it's kind situation. of the same concept, though. Like, I feel like he's a poor man's Kyle Gibson type. You know what I mean? Like, you'll get Definitely innings. You'll man. get some... And that's sad because poor man Kyle's good. Like Kyle Gibson is poor man's poor man usually. Yeah, <laughs> but like Sro- Kyle Gibson has got a six twenty five ADP. Yeah, so and I, I get it again. If you're talking about draft champions formats, which again I know you reiterate this over and over again, but it's a fifteen team draft and hold basis. So fifteen teams, fifty rounds. You draft them. That's all you have for the year. No waivers, no trades, and it's what seven hundred and fifty players drafted. Uh, yes. So there you go. That's I just want. I, I know you re- reiterated a ton, but I figured I'd hit up on that because I want to emphasize just how deep of leagues we are talking about these guys in. And they weirdly, are, weirdly enough, between the two, I'd probably go Schuster just because he threw like 130 innings last year between the minors and the bigs. Mm-hmm. Soroka 32, and those are his first innings in like three years. And he so, didn't look good. At no, all. so that's a, a weird dynamic. We spent probably way too much time on these players. Um, <laughs> bummer if you're in the deepest of deepest formats, oh. he could get run into a few saves at the Braves, but nothing crazy there. Uh, I'll just jump to it. You mentioned Paul DeYoung on the White Sox. Pretty much the only main <laughs> thing I have there. I'm with you. I just want to clarify. Like uh, he's basically just a holding spot for Colson Montgomery. But the part I wanted to mention, I highlight what you said is. You know, I, I like the idea of taking chances on Colson Montgomery, but only in draft and hold formats, 12 more, and 15 and fifteen's fine. I wouldn't do it in a redraft just yet because I do believe it's going to be – I he could start the year with the team. That's not out of the realm of possibilities. I'd be extremely shocked if he started the team. I expect it to be at least a two- to three-month situation before we see Colson Montgomery because the White Sox are crying poor and they suck, so they have no reason to bring him up. Do you have anything else on the, the Young signing, which we really haven't highlighted yet? Well, that was kind of it. Like he's a placeholder, and I think it goes back to Montgomery only getting 167 plate appearances in Double A. So he hasn't even touched Triple A. You can argue he needs more seasoning and all that good stuff too. So, and you mentioned it. They're they're, they're in no rush. They're not competing this year. They're filling. They're they're doing the whole fill gap thing with some terrible players. That's why I think Schumach might actually be the most relevant shortstop on this team this year, just because at least Schumach has some redeeming qualities. Again, if the glove is good, I think he runs a little bit, which was the thing about Schumach. And I know we kind of passed over him, but he's yeah, he had 27 stolen bases last year in the minors and 16 home runs. And the home run, the power isn't really staying. Only a 173 ISO matches a career high for him in the minors. So it's one of those things where. He's not enough. Like he can be viable. Like if you're taking, like he's probably going. Where, where did you say he was going? Seven Eleven? No, no, he's not. Schuster was Seven Eleven. You wanted Schumacher. Schumacher's not even being drafted. I at least since it. November yeah, one. Since eleven one, he hasn't been drafted. Yeah. But if you want a guy like a fiftieth round, like hey, this guy could get playing time. Like I need plate appearances. I need a shortstop. I think Schumacher ends up in as a starter sooner than later, given De Young's unlikely. Uh, <laughs> just performance. I'm not expecting much from him, I guess. Yeah, so yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm not excited, but you're, again, we're talking about turning over every stone and this name. Watch, I'm telling you, there's gonna be a time where like, hey, you need speed, go go get this guy off the waiver wire type, and 15s or something. You know what I mean? Like for sure. Uh, let's talk Ronaldo Lopez. This is one that uh, is a very intriguing one for the fact that he's turned into quite a reliever. We know this very very well. Uh, but the Braves have come out and said they want to like stretch him out to potentially be a starter which um, was interesting to me because we haven't really seen that since 2019 with the White Sox, and he had some very up-and-down seasons as a starter. He's really settled in as a reliever over the past three years, racking up wins, occasional saves, good ratios, the whole shebang. But I guess the biggest thing is, like, you look at the Braves' staff, it's Strider, it's Freed. Morton is still up in the air. He hasn't completely accepted the option yet. He still might retire. You have Bryce Elder. They just traded for Marco Gonzalez, who we'll talk about soon, who's already been mentioned as getting dealt. Like, he's not even sticking around. So there's holes in the rotation. So the Ronaldo thing makes sense in that regard, but at the same point, does it? How does that affect his fantasy value to you? Is what I'm trying to say. He has an ADP of five eleven, and that's you're, it's a Braves pitcher. You know, just like last year, you mentioned Schuster. You mentioned insert. I, I'm trying to remember. 
Miss Miss Hoffer, thank you. Oh, I don't, he wasn't drafted. I don't think. I think I was, I'm trying to think who the other one was. I wonder if it's. I'm, I'm scrolling down their page right now. Was it Dodd? Maybe no. Yeah, Dylan Dodd. Dylan was it Dodd? Dodd? It was Dodd versus Schuster in spring training. It was like who would and, make the final. Spot. And both. So those guys were getting pushed up, and that goes. And that's what I'm getting at. Was um, I think it's rightfully so. You're chasing the team context. I think Reynaldo Lopez. If you're getting five and dive out of him. I still think he has value there. I just don't. I, I think where he's going is fair. Five hundred, pick five hundred and later. You're taking a shot on a guy that I don't. I think the best days are behind him as a starter, and even in a multi inning role, he could be uh, very useful because if he's pitching the multi innings, high leverage multi innings, could be like he could fall into a Matt Brash type of win upside. You know, not necessarily. I wouldn't say he'd get the strikeouts or the ratios, but maybe he gets maybe sneaks you some wins. A guy that's useful in the deepest of formats, but we're talking again. It's a deep cut there. And I was just looking, and over the last two years. Uh, Lopez has pitched two innings over the last two years. He's pitched two innings, maybe seven times, eight times. That's what I'm concerned Total. about. Like, like, like two innings in an outing. Like it's been one inning outings or less in eight. all, but like seven or eight. I'm trying to do a quick math and just count as I go through all the 2022 and 2023's appearances, but that's really difficult on the fly. So yeah, right. like I said roughly ten or less. He's gone two innings, and other than that, it's been one uh, less than two innings. So yeah, because he totally changed his pitch mix up to become a reliever or mm-hmm. starter. So it's just a whole different dynamic. That's why I'm curious. Yeah, on um, what comes of this, um, if he could somehow bring that pitch mix into like a five inning starter, awesome. That's just not always easy to do, of course. Yeah, exactly. Um, last bit of news here for the Braves. This is the big one that just took place a couple days ago. The aforementioned Jackson Coar. And prospect Cole Phillips were traded to the Mariners, so another dump for Jared Kellenick, Marco Gonzalez, and Evan White. I just mentioned Marco Gonzalez. There are already rumors that he is going to be in a package to go somewhere else. Like the, I believe it was the GM or someone from the the Braves said, "Do not expect Marco Gonzalez on the team come opening day." Is what it came down to. So he's pretty much already gone. Evan White's costing seven to eight million dollars a year the next two years because that's the he signed one of those early contracts, yet he hasn't played in the bigs in over a year. So I could see that one disappearing at some point in time. So Jared Kelnick, let's talk about him, Mr. Mr. Kerland. I, I don't know what to think. Um, I Kelnick has the tools. We know he can steal bases, he can hit home runs, he barrels the ball well, hits the ball hard. Last year was a career high hard hit rate for Kelnick, 45.5%. His bar rate was 9.5%, was actually the lowest of his career, but still 9.5% is pretty solid. I, I obviously 10% and above is kind of like the good barrel rates, I would say. But um, yeah, all things considered, 9.5 is fine. And so I trust Kelnick to still be that guy who could hit the ball hard. Hit, the, uh, hit home runs, steal bases, but I think where his value comes is going to be as a right fielder for them because obviously they're going from Eddie Rosario and Ozuna and insert crappy like plug in. Well, isn't Acuna right fielder though? That's kind of the problem. Yeah. So Kelnick graded out best in right field. That's I was, I was looking at his defensive metrics and he had graded out best in right field. In left field, he was a negative one outs above average instead of. Instead of the two that he is in right field, so I'm not sure how much of a difference that's going to play if they move. I doubt they move Acuna over, but still, I bet you if we go, I, I go look at Rosario right now. I bet you it's like negative five because Rosario is just known to be a piss poor defender, and I think Kalnick can at least be trained up to be a better defender and improve. If he could be that good in right field, he'd probably turn around and be that good in left field. So at the end of the day, I think the defensive upgrade is there. I think they st- the problem is is Von Grissom. We know he's a major league hitter, but the glove has hasn't found a home. And I don't know if they're going to trade him. So I think Von Grissom takes the biggest hit because Von Grissom went from having a spot, a, a chance for everyday playing time to more of the probably the weak side platoon and filler at infield spots as players need rest. One thing we did see with this team, though, with the Braves last year, outside of Rosario, they didn't platoon anybody. It was Rosario was platooning and everybody else played like as many games as they can handle. I don't know if you like pretty much Acuna, Albies, Riley, Olsen. Those guys are not going to line up. Even Ozuna, as long as he's hitting, is going to be hitting every day. Arcia plays every day when he's healthy. So, uh, and just the because I'm curious, I had to look it up. So, left field last year. Oh my goodness, last year uh, Rosario was a better left fielder <laughs> than <laughs> than uh, than Kalnick, but I still don't buy that. Like, I, I still think he's going to be just fine. Uh, I think Kalnick's going to be just fine as a fielder. But regardless, I, I think it was a smart move from the Braves to take advantage of a talent they know is there and see if they can turn the most out of him. But I don't know if if the glove if the glove plays up, I think he'll play a little more against lefties than a strict platoon, but we'll see. Yeah, I think I think he still plays okay. I know Chris Clegg uh, posted his lefty righty splits last year, and his le- he actually was better 
first left-hand pitch and a right-hand pitch, which was uh, pretty impressive for Kellenic. That was a big hole for him early on. Um, but it is the Braves. It's what they love to do outside of obviously you know, splitting time with their catchers. They um they do like that one outfield spot to kind of rotate things around. That's their jam. Like you mentioned, Harrison Acuna ain't going nowhere. So um they, they leave one spot for the whole thing. And I think Kelnick's going to be the – I wouldn't be shocked if he plays every day, but at the same time, it's tough to see it that way. Well, was Kelnick were his were those the splits from the minors? I'm only asking because I'm looking at his splits right now. And well, let me see what Clegg posted. Because I'm going to call out Clegg. I'm being wrong there, or you. One of you guys are getting called. I'm just going to repeat uh, what I saw. I was trying to give credit where credits due. Yeah. So so versus lefties, 26.9 percent K rate compared to 23.32 percent K rate for Kelnick against righties. Uh, against lefties, a 703 OPS versus a 762 OPS. Which is lefty being a lower one there. WRC plus of 90 against lefties, 101 against righties, and um, only 67 play appearances. So it's not even a sample size at this point, honestly. It's not really fair. Jared Kelenic was much better against lefties last year than previously in his, in his career. First right handed pitchers, he had 251, 334 weight slash, 32.5% K rate, 65% contact versus lefties. He had 259, 315, 459 with 29.3% K rate and a 72% contact rate. So Kalanick in 2021 against lefties actually wasn't terrible. Hit 265, OPS was worse. But uh, yeah, one of those things where you can't judge. But the problem is, is these sample sizes are all too small. 120 in 2021, uh, 2022, 33, 2023, uh, 67. Oh, I'm looking. You know what? I'm an idiot. I was looking at Eddie Rosario. Oh, my God. Yeah, you are, you are an idiot that we've established I was, before. I, I'm so annoyed by that. I forgot. I forgot. I remember I switched over to him. Now I'm going to look at the split. So, yeah. Let's see. I was like, Kellenic has improved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, last year, he technically had a better batting average against lefties. I was going to say. And his contact and, rate and, was okay, better. And, and his strike rate was better. And the OPS was. Yeah, he still struck out a ton. What but the heck? Less than right. Uh, Hey, Clegg, I'm sorry for listening, buddy. I'm sorry for <laughs> listeners. I'm sorry for all listeners who had to put up with like a two minute rant on how you guys were wrong and how I was You're right. Welcome, Clegg. Game. I got you. I, got I was you. just looking at this. I was looking at the wrong player because I forgot. I forgot. So why? I, you know why? This is what who you looks do. up? Who, who's looking up Eddie Rosario? Who the hell looks up Eddie Rosario on the fly? This yeah. guy does. Only you. Yeah, but there's yeah. So at the end of the day, he did hit Lefty's bear last year, but I still think it's a small sample. I'm going to go back. I'm not going to. I'm still pretty sure it's a small yeah. sample yeah it's still yeah. 92 play appearances so you it's what are you going to take away from that honestly yeah i'm with you there and so 59, yeah 59 59 the year be, before it could be and... the Von Grissom kelnick platoon like you mentioned because that was kind of what they wanted to do with Von Grissom. so so just kind of partially i was very wrong with the player but i was still very right about the sample size so i got something right but damn was that bad Anyway, yeah. Kel- Kelnick two twenty three eighty p, Von Grissom three eighty three eighty. Maybe I need to podcast more so I don't make these rookie mistakes. We'll see how this goes. I keep writing the website, um, and this will transition <laughs> us into the Mariners because they were a part of this past trade, and so we'll start with that one. We already mentioned um, Jared Kelnick with with Kelnick, Marco Gonzalez. Who really cares about Evan White because he's a minor leaguer? But with Kelnick and Gonzalez leaving, I should say. How do you think that opens things up in Seattle for now as they are shopping around for potentially a Rosary? Now, they're rumored in a bunch of trades. That's what DePoto does. They have money to spend, but now DePoto is saying they might not be spending a lot of money. So um, how do you think this opens up the situation? Because, you know, there was a big time outfielder that got traded from Arizona last year that you were a big fan of that went to Seattle. Dominic Canzone, baby. But there's another one there, too, and Cade Marlowe that I was in on. Yep. And I couldn't, and he just wasn't getting the run. And he has like the tools and the, the skill set, but wasn't getting it. I think those two and Taylor Trammell, I think all three of them obviously get full run right now. And this was a team, the Mariners were actually pretty open to platooning. And I just named three lefties. So Trammell, yeah, Canzone, that's, and Marlowe. That's, that's the tough part. They're all lefties. I, th- I don't think Marlowe's been drafted in a DC, but I think that will change because people, oh, he yeah, he, has, he hasn't been drafted since November. I'm looking at November 1 DC stuff. So. But yeah, Marlowe, he's drafted and, in two DC since they started like in November. Well, well, see, well, I'm looking at DC ADP. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, Man, it's some, 746 ADP. He didn't come up on the search for me. All right, whatever. I believe you. Um, because obviously I don't know what I'm doing today. So I'm just <laughs> going to just defer to you. Being uh, I have draft <laughs> champions. Oh, I have from Oct- October 1st. Oh, oh, see, different. So, yeah, so it's funny. So after this, I'm sure he will again. I'm sure he will be drafted. But um, when you look at the numbers, like they weren't so great in the major league level last year. But it's one of those things where in the minors, he did it again. 11 home runs with 29 stolen bases. The year before that, 20 home runs, 36 stolen bases. Decent plate approach. He's very patient, walks a ton. So Cade Marlowe's a guy that 
has potential to be a decent major league uh, fantasy asset. He, he only hit 239 last year with a 346 bad bip, so obviously that's not encouraging. But he's still all in all 112 WC plus. Very small sample, 100 play appearances. So again, can't take much away from it. But I don't think the, the obviously the metrics we got at the major league level don't support the production we saw from him while he was producing. But at the end of the day, we're talking about a guy who's not being drafted in most leagues that should at least get your attention that far in. Of course, Dominic Canzone is the, uh, the one of the bigger winners here. I think he always, I think he always kind of had a spot. They got rid of Mike Ford for so that Canzone shouldn't have issues with at least DHing, and Canzone. Although it's weird, he was he walks a lot more in the minors. Last year, he didn't really walk a whole lot at the major league level. And we know there's some little, there's a little bit of pop there, a little bit of speed. No, not speed, sorry, a little bit of pop there though. The speed is eh, it wouldn't really depend on it, but 12.1 percent barrel rate hits the ball, 42.6 percent hard hard hit rate. Max EV almost one 112, 111.6. Anything over 110 is pretty good. So uh, Canzone, a guy that I think probably the biggest riser of all these names, probably the one that's going to get the most hype. But um, I like Marlowe and Trammell isn't and we've seen flashes in the past as long as there's, and again, we're targeting. We're looking at playing time here. We're looking at guys that should gain. And yeah, the, but see, you're that's weird. So maybe you've heard these two. because I've seen Mariners fans complaining about how the Mariners aren't planning on spending. Like they're actually thinking about possibly selling like Logan Gilbert could be on the move because they don't want they can't afford to pay him. And yeah. um, I think there was n- another name I saw mentioned. Possibly they're, being saying, they're saying Logan Gilbert possibly next year next um, year i've seen yes. i've seen rumors and i'm like dude this team doesn't really have much of a payroll yeah they, they don't want to spend but they want they're they're willing to trade like they're rumored for rosarena but they don't want to spend cash that's why yeah so the mariners fans aren't happy but why, um, why, why go out and trade half the farm like some of your better names for castillo and stuff like that like i agree i i never count depoto out he could be playing he could be playing poker right now for all we know like this is We'll, we'll wait and see. His team's so close to being so good. It's it's tough to watch it go away. But back to what you're saying here, Marlo, yeah, picking in two of the 23 drafts, ADP of 7-Eleven. Um, very, like, if you believe roster resource, we were talking about this before the show, like they do a great job of highlighting situations, but not uh, this time of year kind of locking in playing time correctly. But they, they have Marlo in left field. They have um, Canzone in right field platooning. They have Trammell DHing platooning. So basically, the, the moral of the story is they believe all three of them are involved somewhere in the thing, like Curlin was saying. And you can get Canzone at a 523 ADP. Trammell had 21 homers and 17 steals in AAA last year. And they had a small cup of coffee in the big. And he was a big time prospect in that. I think he came with Castillo or a different deal. Um, he was, he was a, a big time prospect at one point in time. So there are tools there. These are the kind of guys that are good to speculate speculate on later in DCs, 100%, because you wouldn't be surprised if any of the three ran with a job because they all have the skill set to do it, and they all bring some power and some speed to the table in a lineup that was pretty good last year that uh, obviously have to fill some holes that are gone, but at the, at the same time, these could be the guys filling the holes. So it's definitely an angle to look at for sure. And I'm uh, yeah. sorry, real quick, just, like, so just to highlight for what it's worth, defense might matter and this is where i go back into looking at the defense and the only one that graded out negatively defensively of the three trammel canzone and marlo was canzone that's why i think canzone can fit more into that dh and obviously well right now it's just they're showing trammel dh but just flip flop them but my point is is um if you're stuck dhing more and being that fourth outfield type that might hinder you know because if, again if you're if you're playing small ball in terms of pay, paying people you probably want good defense out there right like you probably want to get your pitchers the most defense they can get because you want to avoid runs and trammel and marlow would probably be more secure for playing time if they value the defense more assuming that again but canzone could improve i'm not gonna say he's not it's just one of those things where defense could be the difference maker in terms of who gets the more steady playing time or who isn't platooning because you going only platoon so many players etc so Yep, it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out. But there, there are definitely some good names to put on the list uh, later in your draft and hold formats. Now, with uh, Marco Gonzalez leaving town, and everyone likes to clown on Marco, and I get it. It's Marco Gonzalez, for crying out loud. But at the same time, like late in, in DCs, he was always a guy like a poor man's Quintana. Like this last year, he didn't throw as many innings. Obviously, he got hurt 50 innings. But prior to that, he's had innings. He didn't blow up your ratios. But again, this past year, different story, of course. But with him leaving town, the reason I ask is he could have been like a reliable either long man or something because you got Castillo, Gilbert, Kirby, which is great. Then you have Bryce Miller and Brian Wu, two good young arms, but two young arms that have shown durability issues. So do you think looking at the Mariners, potentially there's another – 
angle like a sixth pitcher to look at in drafts that's why i'm asking um what's his face i didn't see anything off the top of my head emerson Uh, jackson coar could be the guy honestly as weird as that sounds because he used to be be. highly he used to be a highly touted prospect maybe he just needs a chance who knows i'm not excited but we saw hancock debut last year injury uh shortened i remember blowing a little more fab on him than i wanted to but i wanted to take a shot upside because he was a I remember him being a decent prospect. I mean, he was, he was a former a prospect. Yeah. yeah, former number six overall pick. Yep. So Hancock, and we've seen obviously the managers develop pitching relatively well. I mean, you got you have you have Gilbert, you have uh, Kirby, Miller, Bryce Miller. Yeah, so Luke, so yeah, um, so farm. Hancock. I think Hancock would be the uh, name to of the spare pieces to probably know in case there's a rotation opening, assuming he's healthy. But even then, he didn't really show us any skill that like stood out you know what i mean it was just one of those things where you're kind of betting on the 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 team context and it's a good ballpark and all that too so uh but hancock i think emerson hancock's probably one of the few and like you said Coar, as long as he's there yeah. he's not getting shipped out so again he's, he's got a pull on the hancock call for sure is demander of innings that's where this is where i think they could probably end up training for like a, a veteran pitcher or even signing like a michael walker well, when does robbie ray come back he got surgery at the beginning of the year, I'd imagine mid-season, give or take. That's what I'm thinking. So I think they it, it's one of those things where if they trade Gilbert or something, they would just probably limp their way to the Robbie Ray return. Yeah. Between I think Hancock would be who they lean on and then Coar. And then I don't know enough about their farm system to suggest anyone else, but uh they they or they can just go sign a a, a warm body, you know, maybe Bartolo Cologne with his 80 mile per hour stuff in that league that they're playing in over there can come over. That'd be fun, actually. I would love that. I'd buy a jersey tomorrow. All right, let's have some fun. I'm going to combine these two. Uh, early in the offseason, the Mariners acquired Luis uh, Urias from the Red Sox, utility guy, third baseman for the most part. We remember with the Brewers to the Red Sox. Now here he comes to Seattle. And then a, a, a week or so later, the Mariners traded A. Eugenio Suarez to the Diamondbacks for Carlos Vargas and Sebi Zavala. Not too worried about the Vargas. Could be a reliever type guy. Zavala, backup catcher, whatever. With Suarez leaving town, is Urias the guy for you at third base? Are there other options you're looking at? Is Urias even worth looking at type situation? I'm not – I've given up hope on him. I was in on Urias for a couple of seasons, and he would show flashes. We all know that. It, it was like it was him and Arcia, and they were like – I remember, weren't they fighting out in, in Milwaukee at one point? Yep. And um, I really liked both of them at one point or another. Arcia took us forward again finally last year, but Urias just hasn't. And at this point, I mean, maybe this team will give him full run finally. I just have a hard time being that interested because he just had Urias hasn't put it together. He did okay in 2022, like 16 home runs. Yay. It's almost a <laughs> you, 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 you know, Suarez profile minus like half the power. That's the problem. Like, yeah, I, like if you're not giving me batting average and you're giving me teens home runs, what are you doing for me? I know he struggles against righties too. So that's kind of like the thing is that. The struggles against the, the righties. Like he hit 183 against them last year. What was the OPS? I can only imagine 614. Not that he hit much better against righties, but for his career, I think in general, against righties, Urias has been a rather lackluster 691 OPS against righties his whole career. So it's yeah. not not somebody who's that fancy viable, even full time at bats. We're talking again, reserve rounds just because he has a pulse. But even then, I'm looking for somebody else probably if I can. Okay, what's your thoughts on uh, Suarez going to the desert, to the D-backs, who basically, for me, the slots in for Longoria, and it's pretty much the same thing with maybe more power. Yeah, I think we can see, you know, the playing time's there, and that's kind of the big deal. So you're kind of, he is who he is type of thing. I think he's just a linear value. We saw a step backwards in terms of the power production and metrics and stuff last year. So his age finally becoming a factor for Suarez, maybe. Um, I'm not all that interested in on that cost or in general this year, just because he's like, he's just such a, he's just such a guy, such a jag, you know, <laughs> like, like I, I don't know. Like if I, ha- if I miss out on all third, if their base kind of falls off randomly. So if I miss out, maybe I'll, I'll land on him, but I haven't found myself falling that deep into the abyss and having to deal, scoop him up as my starting third baseman. But at the end of the day, you know, you're getting power and probably some decent RBIs in that lineup. So. Yeah, ADP of 282 right now. He's a dude, and I know I'm preferencing since October 1st. So that's because there's 23 drafts. I'll start shrinking that down as they start pumping him out faster. But uh, I, I, Suarez is a guy that I like as a backup third baseman in, in draft and holds because, like you said, you know the playing time's there. He can supply you some power. He might hurt you elsewhere, but at the, at the worst, he's going to get you power in playing time, which if he runs hot, it's very, very productive. 
and it's hard to find that kind of depth at third base because you will need backups in those formats. So that's something I definitely like to take a peek at. Uh, last thing I'll mention here, I don't think it has a huge impact, but with uh, Urias leaving Boston, obviously Devers was playing third base. That wasn't the issue. Story is going to slide into shortstop. Second base is where I guess the question was because Urias was kind of helping there. You had Emmanuel Valdez. Um, Bobby Dahlback played some second base last year. Maybe the answer is not there. I know like Cross wants India or someone to come over there. Um, are you interested in Does anybody else gain values? I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's funny because uh, I've obviously been pretty vocal in the past about being in on Emmanuel Valdez, and I think the bat can play, but the glove is just not that great. And I don't know how much they want to value that type of defense, so that would probably lean towards Pablo Reyes getting the playing time if they care about the defense. But I think from what I've read and stuff, it's pretty much an open competition for now. But, I mean, a guy like Emmanuel Valdez limits swing and miss, limits chasing, above average zone contact for Valdez. I love those types of skill sets, but unfortunately, he's a negative four out to ball replacement and a negative six DRS, which are defensive metrics. And it goes back to can a young, can this guy, like in his mid 20s, can he put in the effort and become a better fielder to so that way he can get that bat in lineup? Because a 10.7% barrel rate is great. I mean, hard hit rate's lackluster, but give me a guy who could barrel the ball and if he, and he he pulls a decent amount and elevates it. He get, I wish he'd elevate a little more, but he has a history of elevating it a lot better than he did in, in his time at Major League, so maybe he gets comfortable with Major League pitching and Valdez can elevate the ball more, let the power play up. Regardless, though, that's kind of wish casting. I don't want to go that route. However, if they care about the bat, I think he gets in. Pablo Reyes being a 30-year-old guy, I don't know if they want him to be a starting second baseman for this team, but yeah. he can be. Um, we saw him, you know, he yeah, can run a little bit. last year. And he he was relevant at times too. I remember him being kind of relevant for a little bit, and then kind of fell right back to obscurity. But going back to the defensive stuff, because apparently I'm, I have a hard on for defense these days. <laughs> it's it's just because it it really matters in these things. You're talking about a guy. Okay, so for reference, why it matters? Uh, you're talking about a guy that. Well, actually, yeah. So <laughs> negative four. I mentioned you know, I mentioned negative four and negative six for those numbers were for Valdez. Zeros zeros like the average. The average. Yeah. Reyes wasn't much better. He was a negative two, negative five. So it was still better, but I don't know. I don't know if it's enough. I think it's one of those things where I really think Valdez can make up the difference there and be at least as good as Reyes defensively. Because I feel I feel like I've heard the narrative of Reyes being a better defender. And then you look at the numbers and you're like, well, I guess he's technically better, but he's not good. <laughs> there's a difference. There's a difference there between being better and good, right? Yes. So, uh, but yeah, I'm, Dahlbeck is not happening. It's not a thing. Yeah. Um, I think they're yeah. still going to make a move. Like India is a great fit there. I think there's a few other options that. Yeah. The, and, the Red Sox are trying to be. They got new people in the front office. I think they're going to try to make a push here, but and, who, and see where things go. The problem is, is a team like the Reds need or the yeah the Reds they need pitching and they don't exactly have any here in Boston to trade. And I don't think many teams have pitching a trade. Maybe a team maybe. like the Marlins, but the Marlins don't need another second baseman. They have like 15. Yeah. Even after losing Wendell, they still have like 15 second basemen in that roster. So it's one of those things where um. Yeah, I don't know. It's one. I just it's, it makes sense, but unless they are unless they don't want, I don't know what type of pitching they'd be able to give up, and unless they're willing to move off the idea of getting pitching for India, maybe you get a Whitlock or a Tanner Houck. Houck would be probably a dream for them at this point, given what the Reds are trying to do. But whatever, we'll see. Yeah. Speaking of the Reds needing pitching, let's talk about their two signings this so far this off season. Uh, they first started off with reliever Emilio Pagan, who we've you know there was times in. Minnesota, where we thought he was the next guy, and then that obviously kind of deteriorated after a bit. He's shown signs of being a pretty good setup, seventh and eighth inning guy, which is just probably where he'll slide in here in Cincinnati for now. But uh, any insight on a guy like Emilio Pagan, who is pretty much just a dart throw in the end games, if necessary, like a 718 ADP right now? Yeah, Pagan becomes a guy that is more valuable if you have Alexis Diaz, and that's kind of what I would like. Almost like I don't necessarily. Uh, subscribe to the idea of hey you got to handcuff your closer but this is one of those, this is one of those rare situations where you look at this team and i think pagan is clearly the next man up it's not like one of those things where it's like well maybe it's this guy maybe it's this guy i think it's clearly diaz pagan at the back end of that rotate back in the lineup i could see diaz maybe slotting into high leverage situations if they believe in pagan you know what happened last year that can carry over so maybe there's uh, maybe Diaz is still like the majority. Like I, I like Alexis Diaz. I have no problems taking him. I feel confident in him getting 25 to 30 saves. But maybe it's closer to 25 instead of 30 because Pagan. Maybe they want Diaz in like the core lineup, and then Pagan come clean up at the end. That, that's the only thing I can think of. Maybe something like that happens. But even then, I don't necessarily believe 
and 25 to 30 is like low end for Diaz after we saw what 37 I think it was last year so um I'm kind of low balling him there probably to be honest but I really like Diaz um uh, whatever but with that being said yeah Pagan's a guy that if you're looking you know he's gonna get innings you know it's gonna be high leverage innings and we know the Reds are a team on the rise it's not a bad back end of your DC pick just for an RP spec if you're chasing ratios K's and maybe a few throw in saves on occasion Yep, 100% agree with you there. He's got the long shot guy. I wouldn't be shocked if some point in the season, Curl and I are discussing on a Monday Fab recap, got picked up. That wouldn't Forgot surprise him. me. Well, I'm picking it up for $2 because I'm chasing saves and he's been yep. getting one every other week or something. Yep, yeah. wouldn't surprise me. That's a guy we're talking about at some point in time. Now, this name is intriguing. It would be more intriguing if it wasn't Great American Small Park where he'd call home. But this is Nick Martinez. because One reason it's intriguing, ADP over 400 which is nice, um, but at the same time, it's a guy we've seen be really good out of the bullpen, have flashes in the rotation, a lot of back and forth with a guy like Nick Martinez. You know, made nine starts last year, 10 starts, 18 starts uh, since returning. He returned to the bigs in 2022 after being overseas for a while. Still hasn't gotten more than 110 innings in a season, but in his last two seasons, you know, sub 3-5 ERA between the bullpen and the rotation, uh, decent strikeout stuff, but it's great American small park. Other caveat, though, they're pretty much going to let him run, it looks like. I guess it's his like, 150 innings is realm of possibilities. So what's your thoughts with Nick Martinez? I'm curious to see what happens. I think, so as a starter last year, 42 innings, 42.2 compared to 67.2 as a reliever. And he performed better as a starter last year, actually, which, you know, again, usually is the opposite. You see guys kind of flash better numbers as a reliever because, you know, less innings, can throw harder, et cetera, et cetera. But um, as a starter last year, 42 or so innings and the, the, the underlying metrics suggested he got kind of lucky so I, I believe the underlying metrics and now you're taking those metrics and putting them in uh putting them in at the small smallest ballpark or at least the hitter hitter friendliest ballpark at this point yeah i'm not really outside of streaming on road games type of thing i'm not really going to be in on him he's gonna be a guy that you'll see him like you mentioned fab recaps that we picked up and maybe maybe they have like a run of like a bunch of road games coming up and his and if you You'll, you'll sit there and look at his uh, schedule, and he's scheduling out, okay, three out of the next four starts on the road. That's the type of guy you'll pick up just because, oh, he has three out of four starts on the road coming up. I can start him and kind of set and forget for a month, so, assuming that he's still decent. So that's the type of thing with Martinez that um, he's going to be very, very – it's almost like the course pitchers type of thing these days. I treat these guys almost like course pitchers where I'm like, I'm afraid to have these guys. Even though they have really good pitchers, I'm afraid of all of them with that home ballpark because we've seen a home ballpark. Great American has been more offensive than Coors, so that makes It's sense. unforgiving. It's unforgiving with home runs especially. Let's go to the Brew Crew here who have uh, been active on the trade world and a couple other things as well. But they started off when we were in – or I was in first pitch Arizona, sitting there watching yeah, a panel. Me. I get an alert on my phone from Underdog Fantasy as I'm sitting next to Brendan Tuma from Underdog Fantasy. Uh, so I, I got I witnessed he does not run the account, which is interesting. I'm uh, just kidding, Brendan. Um, Mark Connor traded to the Detroit Tigers – to open up some outfield stuff. And then they also traded Abraham Toro to the A's. So I'm going to package those. We can talk about those two players and their destinations in a minute. But with Kana leaving town, the Toro leaving town, I guess it kind of shores up a few things. Uh, we'll get into their signings here in a second. But Kana came over at the deadline, played a lot of first base with Rowdy Stinking slash platooning, uh, DH'd a bit. So that kind of opens that world up. And then you have uh, Toro, who was just a utility dude. So any thoughts on how this plays out? It's 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 a pain. Uh, Toro is just going to find playing time with the A's because it's the A's. The A's won't. I saw a report the A's. I know it's a side ta- tangent shocker, but I saw a report say the A's aren't looking to trade Seth Brown or Paul Blackburn. I'm like, what are the A's doing here? They're sabotaging their team because not only are they not trading away the few assets they have for young, they never do well. I think you even mentioned it on a podcast where it's like it's always quantity and it's crap quantity at that. It's like they are sabotaging this team. They don't want. They don't even want their prospects to be good, so they don't have to pay arbitration prices. I feel like, like that's how bad this team is. So the A's are not. So it goes back to sorry. So anyway, so that goes. The reason why I'm saying all that is because I think Toro gets playing time over a more deserving younger player because of that. Yep. Because because I swear it's like they hold everybody back. Anybody with a pulse who is interesting or exciting or could or should be given plenty of run on a team like that doesn't get it. Anyway. Um, this team is just so loaded now with outfielders. I mean, Jake Bowers is going to play first base slash DH most likely, but you know he can play the outfield in the pinch. But then you have got you have what you have Yelich, 
You have um, Tyrone Taylor. We'll talk you still, about you, in a yeah, you have Trio, Tr- 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 which we'll, again you'll mention Tyrone Taylor and Garrett Mitchell, and that's <laughs> that's as four four players for three spots, not including. And that's I feel like there. Were, I thought there was another one I saw. Maybe I did. Maybe I'm mistaken. Either way, you have all these players. Like, are we really doing this right now? Is I don't know. It's 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 kind of like I don't I don't know. It's it's such a tight, crowded situation. I, I don't really know what to think here with that with this team. I'm still trying. I know you know Yelch is definitely sticking. That's yep. definitely Cheerio sticking now. So. You got to think because they're paying Cheerio probably yep. the second most of all these outfielders. Oh, Weimer, Joey Weimer was the other name. Yeah, right? he's in the minors. You got uh, Sal Freelick. You have Garrett Mitchell. There's a lot of moving parts there. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. So that you gotta think this team's definitely trade. It's like them and the and the Cardinals are trading outfielders. And there's a lot of teams that need outfield help. So mm-hmm. we'll see what happens. I think the problem is is teams that need that have offense like this are usually trying to trade for pitching. And I think the it's one of those things where the demand and the demand is there for the there's not as much demand for hitting as there is for pitching across the league. You, you could you could see those outfielders getting packaged in a Corbin Burns deal. It was like a throw on. That's where that's gonna go. Maybe, and that, that's how they get the most return. Like, okay, yep. you'll get burns because burns is you know short term thing, and then yep. you're but you're gonna get here's a guy who has like eight years of fucking oh, sorry, service language. time. Sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> oh god, yeah, it's one of those things where it's just so crowded. And I loved Garrett Mitchell coming into the draft, like early draft season. I think I drafted him on my first team. Like, oh, I got to get Garrett Mitchell, and now it's like I got to stay with him, Garrett Mitchell. Like, I, I think he's gonna end up with playing time. Maybe not for this team, but. I don't know, man. There's just so many moving parts. It's frustrating because there's some really good, talented players here, and it's hard to tell which ones are going to get that playing time with the current outlook of this roster. Yep, 100% agree. Uh, now, the Mark Connor situation is a little bit more interesting to me just because he's been really good versus lefties in, uh, in his career, especially of late. He's been just a serviceable guy we've seen in recent years. Like, If people were to go look at his stat line, they'd be probably like, whoa, he actually was not bad, all things considered. Um, and his ADP is 454, so he's not costing a lot. Now he's going to Detroit, where he's even like the elder statesman there, almost 35 years old. But it's still a team that needs veteran leadership and needs guys to carry down positions. You know, Kerry Carpenter's good. We like him, obviously. Riley Green should be healthy. Um, you got some other options there. But for now, they got Kana penciled in in the outfield. He could obviously DH as well. Um, Akil Badu, maybe platoon situation. Who knows? But how do you see the Kana situation playing out? Yeah. I don't know what Detroit's doing. What Detroit's doing. I, I guess I'm trying to load their page right now. See if I can just get a fuller look of everything. I, I heard you, but it's one of those things where I, I got to see it. So we got Carpenter, Green, Meadows. Yeah. So Kana, at, I think Kana's going to be that outfield slash first base help. Like NDH. I, I think it's all going to work itself out. I think Kana's firmly in there right now with the current state of this outfield. Unless they really want to get Badu, maybe they can honestly platoon Badu in him. But Badu hasn't really done much since that rookie year. That, that, that and it wasn't even the whole rookie year; it was like part of the rookie year. Um, Kana, I think it's almost like what they brought in. I'm trying to remember, maybe I'm mistaken. Am I, am I, I'm thinking of a name, but I feel you know what I'm thinking. Matt Verling. I think it feels very Matt Verling-ish, where it's like this guy is going to come in, play often, and he'll be good, not great, and useful in deeper, in deepest of formats because he's going to play. But Kana is even like, wor- like I, don't know, I don't have any interest. I think he's just going to find his way into playing time initially. And if he doesn't, and if Connor slows down or doesn't cut it, he'll end up being on a weak side platoon guy, probably more than likely. That sounds like an interesting pick at 750, to say the least. Oh, well, he's going to play. So, yeah, that's I think I th- I, I, that's I, a I lot think, of that pass at 450. As I, I, I think he, I think it's worth, he's worth a draft pick in the reserve rounds of a DC. Absolutely. I just, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, there's just no excitement there. This team, it's the it's the Tigers, and then now you add a even you take him from a good ballpark to a terrible one. That's not any doing anyone any favors. And yeah, his splits are notable these days against lefties and righties. He's serviceable against righties, but he's he hit lefties really well last year in comparison. So again, if there's a, any slowdown in that production, we can see him get stuck into this weak side platoon. Yep, no doubt about it. Now the moment kind of hinted at it finally happened. I believe on Monday, actually yesterday, as we record on Tuesday, Jackson Trio. The big time prospect for the Milwaukee Brewers, the gentleman that's not even twenty years old yet. He uh, has not played. He played six games in Triple A last season. He just got a. He got paid. Just put it that way. And I'm, I'm happy for him because he'll be able to get an even. He's going to get like eighty million dollars guaranteed, and he'll be, I believe, twenty seven when the deal's up, and he can really cash in if he wants to. Like, there's a lot of money coming his way. But we're not here to talk finances. We're here to talk about position. His ADP is 212 in November. He's gone as high as 155. Those have been the recent drafts since um, 
the news dropped, basically. So people are very pumped on him. He's going to be the everyday outfielder, power speed machine, and in double A last year, 22 homers, 43 steals, hit 280. But again, young, never, not one at bat in the major leagues. Uh, what's your thoughts on Trio, especially at that current ADP? Yeah, I don't, I, I, he's already moving up. That's the thing. Like, if you, in my, in a couple, is the high. And, and in a draft I was in, I think he went around the same range, maybe a little lower. And I think that's probably appropriate. I like the idea of Shurio. I just don't know if this year is the year. I think what everyone's going to say, I think everyone's going to say that he's, yeah. he's going to be 20. Um, I'm trying to see his max. I can't be right. Oh, that's his MLB Max EV. It's not showing his oh, okay, double A. Because, okay, so I, I was just looking at his because I can, I have some stats. I have, uh, anyway, I was just looking at some stats. His Max EV wasn't, yeah, he didn't really, it's not registering on this leaderboard I'm looking at because double A doesn't have stat cast. Never mind. I was just curious to see the power metrics because I know the powers, I think it'll come. I think it'll mature into some power. I just don't think the power will be there necessarily day one. Yeah. So it's one of those things where, the stolen bases are definitely a thing. Sherry is going to definitely steal bases. I think he's going to start off at the bottom of the order and need to work his way up. Very doable, but you got to, you know, think about the fact that he's going to lose some play appearances to start the year, which are going to hurt counting stats. Um, at the end of the day, I, I, I'm okay with it, I guess. I won't have a lot of shares at that cost, honestly. I just won't at the new, at least at what I think the new cost is going to be. But I can see taking a shot. I think it's also league dependent. If, like, if I'm in a shower league, I like upside. I'll take upside. I'll take a, sh- I'll take a share too. And a deeper format, which is why I play, I don't see myself diving in there just because of the talent that's going to be going around the 150, 175 range. I think that there's talent of similar, of similar potential, or maybe not similar temp- potential, but I feel like a lot safer and more projectable production. And I like that type of security there usually because I'm building, I'm still building out the core of my roster. And I, if I take a gamble, it's usually on health over a rookie in that area. Yep. No, I'm with you 100. That's my my downside. Usually, <laughs> I probably won't be like I would have been maybe more intrigued at like the 250 range. If he stays where, yeah. If he stays where he's at, yeah. We have a huge problem. Like that's yeah. just gonna be. That's talk like maybe a third pitcher or another stable starting guy. We've that's seen, yeah. That's why I struggle with. That's why I said like in 15s, it's it's tough. Some people are gonna be like really in on them and I'm, and they can hit. I just don't. You know, it's it's. I think we're spoiled with how good rookies have been that we forget that a 20 year old can struggle his first taste of the majors. And, and not even just the majors, but he didn't even see triple A pitching. Not yeah. that I mean, I think I think some of those pitching is probably in double A these days anyway. But still, we're talking about a guy that we're talking about a kid here that he's gonna, he's gonna come out and crush the spring training, isn't he? And oh, yeah. shoot up boards and shoot up even higher. <laughs> then it's gonna be really out of my pay grade. Then, then it's easy. Uh, it's easy. Like I, I know Cross weird. Cross loves him and wants to have shares at around one fifty. I think Clegg was a little more timid on the last episode yeah. we talked about, but. um it's going to be a popular thing. People are going to be in on them. There will be somebody. It's like the old joke with most like players you're not in on. Well, it's like no big deal. Someone else will like him more than me, anyways. Like LED of the Cruise or stuff like that. Like, people are going to like him enough, or you, it won't even be a problem for you. If Ellie fell to me in the th- like Ellie in the second isn't my where I'm doing, but in RDC he almost like he started getting close to falling in the third, and I was like, if he falls me in the third, I'm going to take him. I think he went early third, but still, like that. I, I, I some people like players like that have a price for me. Shario has a price for me. I just don't know if I'm willing to pay the new price. And that's yeah. the problem. Same thing with Kelnick. He's kind of, I think they're both going to get pushed up in a similar area because of team context or what have you. But I don't think either. I'm trying to think of who's going. So I just pulled the DC ADP as well. From, and I'll just do all of it from the October 1st. And let's go. I'm just curious some names, like say around 150 ish. Like the problem is, is you have names like Chaz McCormick. Like, oh, do I really want, I don't know if I want Chaz McCormick over him. Jorge Soler. Soler, that's a skill set thing. Do I want power or speed? So it comes into obviously team context will matter. But Honestly, looking at these names, I think he belongs there because yeah. I don't know how much more how much more do I really I don't I can tell you right now I don't think I want McCormick over him, and I love McCormick, but I Churio seems more intriguing. Ian Happ, I think I rather have Churio, and that's like so it's like he belongs where he's going, but I just don't know. But I like you said, I'm usually looking for other things there. But if he goes up high, like Santander is kind of pushing it for me. I like Santander a little more. Evan Carter, now you're getting the see Langford and Carter going right there, one thirty seven, one thirty eight. Cheerio is probably gonna end up right there with those guys because it's gonna become a group of like rookies or whatever. It's gonna be like, hey, well, all, it, all it takes hot spring training, like you said. And next thing you know, he's going towards 100, probably. Yeah, and that's the thing. So it's like right now, like I, I can understand probably going around 150 ish just because I, I mentioned some names there and the names I mentioned. It's like, well, now that you think about it, yeah, I can see Cheerio going there, but I don't know if I want to pay 
the premium that I think I, th- I think why I think we're with the, we're on the same page here. I'm just rambling because that's what I do. I think we're on the same page in terms of I think we know what the cost is now, but we I think the cost is what, what the cost is going to be is what we don't want to pay. Because exactly. I think you're I think it's going to be a little more inflated. It will be out of my my pay grade come come draft time. Maybe I need to uh, grab a share too while it's still affordable. Then there you go. Maybe this draft I'm not, I'm right not, now. Go for it with your next pick. Um, <laughs> the Brewers. The last move for the Brewers. They re-signed Wade Miley, the 37 year old. Mm-hmm. People get really bored, like whatever, but ADP of almost 490. And all Wade Miley does is keep your ratios down. This is what he does. It's a, it's a proven, like he's done it time and time again. 23 any, or twenty-three starts this last year, 314 ERA. He had uh, eight starts the previous year, 316. 28 starts, 337. Um, he had a rough 2020, which is a shortened season, then a 398, 257. His ERAs have been outstanding of, of in recent years. Uh, whip a little different. Whip can hurt you. Whip can hurt you good. He doesn't strike out a lot of guys. But if you're looking for some some ratio help in the ERA department, he could be your guy super late in drafts. Exactly. I think Miley's going to be. Hey, we saw Miley be super serviceable in, for periods of time last year. I don't see why that's going to change. I was actually trying to look up his. Uh, I was getting curious about his his player rate. I think he was like a three dollar player last year. Three three and a half dollar player, which considering where he's going, it's actually projecting quite a bit higher. Like a three and a half dollar player in those that late of a pick is actually a really good uh, quality player i'd say for yes, dc because uh he's not a zero basically right no yeah. but i'm trying i want to see where he ranked i can't seem to find it for some reason i think it's not loading properly for me but anyway it doesn't matter maybe you can find it either way it was uh it's one of those things where he just he also vastly outperformed his underlying metrics i mean a three a low three era with like a fit of 4.69 like uh but at the end of the day, you're it's built into the price. Everyone knows he overperformed and he's going back to the same place he did it though. So maybe he can still do it, just not as good. I don't think he's gonna be as productive, but I think Miley's gonna be useful, especially for periods. He'll be streamable in even 15s. I don't think he'll ever get to that 12 team mixed relevance though. Well, Wade Miley in just 12 team, um, you know, the Yahoo format they have on there. Wade Miley was the 203rd overall player. Which is still, which is, he's going dang he, impressive. As he's going double that, almost four ninety eight p. And if I want to uh, go just by sp, uh, no, that's not what I wanted. To this do. is riveting. It's <laughs> what we do here, folks. I know. Well, it's, I'm curious. I'm just curious because I feel like it goes back to underappreciating these veterans that can put up. And then he production. he was the fifty fifth starting pitcher with a three dollar and sixty cent value. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. It's one of those things where I don't think he repeats necessarily that level of production. But you I do, do think half that production to still pay off his ADP. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, so yeah. it's one of those things where it's like uh, if you're especially like someone like me in one league, I'm doing where I drafted four relief pitchers as my starting rotation. Miley is a great fit for that team because I'm going to need some innings because I'm going to need to stream some innings there. because I. That's just why I wanted to bring him up because people, people like usually poo-poo Wade Miley. I'm like, yeah, you should probably put some a little more respect on his name when it comes to certain formats. He's definitely – and he's very streamable. Viable at times in season like he's that's why i said i think anything i don't think we see him be that viable in 12s all that often but anything i think 15s will be more than viable at various times in, in the season for sure uh cleveland guardians they made an early trade with san diego padres they acquired scott barlow for Eniel de los santos who's a decent reliever as well but the barlow one's interesting you know once the the heralded closer i believe in kansas city um and then he, he got a few saves there with San Diego pitched well. Now it comes to Cleveland with his uh, 445 uh, ADP. And Cleveland just came out a day or two ago saying they are going to start shopping Emmanuel Classe around. So what kind of interest do you have in a guy like Scott Barlow right now as the Guardians still do have do, 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 um, you know, Trevor Steven and a few others around? But Barlow looks to be the man on deck. Yeah, I think they went out and isn't Barlow's price a little more costly than they usually pay for people to? Isn't that like yes, a thing? That, expensive. Was, we were all surprised by that as well. Yes, that's right. I'm trying to remember the price. Yeah. So that and that matters for a team like this, you know, because maybe even if they go if even if Barlow isn't great, maybe they want to try to trade him. Maybe they want to try to flip him. So they'll maybe they'll try to build his value. I don't understand why Jose Ramirez took a, a team, a team, a home team discount to help this team out who doesn't want to help him. That's I feel bad for the guy. Like He took a big discount and for what right but yeah um barlow feels like the next guy up i it's one of those things where S- S- steven and others can do it maybe take a shot on them later if you don't want to pay the barlow price especially when barlow starts rising if class a gets dealt barlow will be the guy that gets the big bump and this is just a team that honestly i'd rather just 
let someone else take Barlow and I'll gamble on somebody else I think can maybe steal the job if Barlow struggles. Yep, 100% with you on that. And then just a minor thing. Like I said, some of these deals won't matter. The Guardians traded Cal Quantrill to the Rockies, T's and P's to Cal Quantrill. <laughs> um, yeah. but we have nothing uh, to talk about there. Um, <laughs> Philadelphia Phillies, they re-signed Aaron Nola. I don't have a ton to say there besides Aaron Nola's Aaron Nola. Yep. you have anything to add to that? He, he, he went home, so it's all good. Yeah, I think I think he's a rebound. I don't. I, I think last year we, it was frustrating and maddening to watch, but I think he's better than that, and I think everyone knows he's better than that. Yep. So now it gets fun. The St. Louis Cardinals, some may say the most active team in free agency this year, they went shopping for starting pitchers that um, maybe passed their prime. I don't know the nice way to say this, but they started with Lance Lynn. Um, they signed Lance Lynn. He has a two eighty four ADP. Then they went and signed Kyle Gibson, who has a uh, 460 ADP, which is kind of tasty, actually, in these formats. And then the creme de la creme, their new ace in the rotation, they signed Sonny Gray, to a one to, uh, who has a 133 ADP. So now that I said the Lynn, the Gibson, the Gray, obviously makes up, you know, you put Mikulis and Steven Matz with them, and Matz is actually rumored to be shocked as well. How do you foresee these players for fantasy purposes? Gray coming off a great season. Gibson's just been Gibson. Lynn coming off a horrific season. So how do you look at this? I think Lynn – I don't think Lynn is that bad. I know he had well, – I've already drafted him once so, <laughs> in like three drafts. It's already – I'm already biting on the price tag. Well, the thing is, is he's in your reserve rounds, so you don't have to yeah. – like if he sucks, you leave him there. There's no gotcha. stress to start him. But a decent ballpark, the division outside the Cubs, I don't necessarily have a problem with. And that's assuming the Cubs keep making moves that work because, you know, they're in on everybody. I'm sure they're going to land some players. Um, but oh, they'll wait the Reds, too. I forgot the Reds now. That's actually a tougher division. I mean, not that again, not that the division matters as much. I know there's you're still playing half your games against your division, but obviously the emphasis is way less than it used to be. I still look at that, though, because, you know, you have it's not just your division. Now you're also most likely pitching in those ballparks, you know, like Milwaukee and Cincinnati. Pirates is good, but uh, you get you get my point. I, I guess my point being, though, Lynn is um I'm OK with Lynn. I, I'm trying to. I haven't taken him yet, but it's like every time I go, I'm like, man, Lance Lynn can't be that bad, right? But then I said that last year at times, and yeah, and then I, I plugged him in. Take into and, his player profile. It's like uh, the strikeouts are still great, but everything else, my god. Then he had that run. He had that run of a few games with LA, when he first right? joined and, the Dodgers. When he first joined, him, like, look at they fixed him. They fixed him, and then no, they no, didn't they, fix him. No, no, no. They put, <laughs> they, put, they put duct tape on a on a on a, on a, yeah. on a hole. The dam know? is leaking. The bubble gum is coming out of the dam again. Yeah. It is leaking. <laughs> um, but it was one of those things where the the it feels like you, you ever heard of those like scratch and dent appliance stores? Yeah, that's what that's what the Cardinals like a Florida man thing. But yeah, but it, so that's a, that's the thing. A scratch and dent is like you go like you know something that comes in like it, it can be brand new, but it gets there's a like a noticeable dent ding in it scratches, so it gets sold for you know cheaper just because of that. It feels like they went they went they went they went to that they went they're like these guys have their flaws but we're gonna go ahead and bring them on anyway and that's what it feels like that you know it's a very much it's insert your old person joke here aarp membership of a, of a rotation whatever they they're gonna have all early games because they have to get to early bird special dinners whatever you want to say you know all that stuff but in, at the end of the day i think kyle gibson is gonna be kyle gibson i think he he's a pitcher these days you know he has like a six pitch repertoire and he just kind of pitches he's a good pitcher Better real life than fantasy. Lynn, I think, will get there. I think Lynn is get away from that cutter up in the zone because I think that's what I think it was this cutter that was getting cranked last year. Anything fat, or anything I was fastballs. Say pretty much anything was, because the thing with Lynn is Lynn's a heavy fastball pitcher. He's a heavy cutter at two four. It's almost all fastballs from Lance Lynn. That's his that's always been the bugaboo, and it finally caught up with him last year. And can he fix that is basically what it comes down to. Can he get away from that? Now, I was looking at his repertoire, and that changeup really stood out to me, but he only threw it 7% of the time, and he only throws it to lefty. So it's one of those things where maybe he needs to get he's comfortable. Almost, yeah, he's almost strictly a fastball pitcher. He's got he needs to get comfortable out. throwing something else. Or uh, maybe I think aren't hitters getting better? I think there was a thing about how high fastballs aren't as effective anymore. So maybe he's the type of guy that with his repertoire, you can you can, you can can attack east and west instead of north and south. That's that a whole different discussion. Look at, man, St. Yeah. Louis usually like, could be mistaken here. Well, they have some, look smart, at they have some smart brains in there to figure some things out, hopefully. No, I don't know, man. Have you seen the way they've treated their uh, <laughs> their rotate their lineup? And, I maybe it's changed. No, like I knew they used to have pitching guys there. It, it, it's likely changed. I'm probably going to sound like an idiot, but it's okay. But you're, you're not, not going to mistake first or the last. So you're not going to okay. mistake Rosario for Kelnick's profile. So that's no, why, and I, uh, that's why I bring you on the show. I still shine no matter what. So I, said, I, said, I, said, I, said, I said the bar low. Yeah. Uh, hey, bar low. Um, 
bringing it all back. Oh you, wow! You, you, There's you a pun the there. There's a pun there. Anyway, I used to yeah back in the back back in the day. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, uh, great talk. so talk Sunny Gray. Gray, Sunny Gray. I mean, I I believe a lot of what we saw last year. I think he's gonna still be just as good. The health is surprising, especially as he's gotten older. But I think he can still give you 150, 160, and, and that's low end. I feel like. I feel like Sonny Gray obviously figured out how to stay healthy. I mean, a pitcher, you don't stay healthy on accident. I think routines change. I think players learn their bodies more. There's more data than ever with things. So I'll have a fluke shoulder or arm injury, which I guess that's not so much a fluke with an older guy who has a history of it. But um, I think Sonny Gray will be okay. I'm okay with his price too. He's like an SP3-ish. Yep. And I think you're. I think that's about fair what to expect, SP3, SP4, depending on how you build your teams. Uh, I like Sonny Gray. I think he was a good signing for them too, a good team. And I think I think it's gonna work out. I'm not too worried about him. But Lynn is the most intriguing just because I think Lynn is still good somewhere underneath all there, all that. Maybe I'm just wish casting because I but I but the price, I mean, and Gibson's Gibson. You know what you're getting. Yeah, Gibson's a guy that I still like will take at the end of the draft just because it's like you, you know what you're getting. Mm-hmm. You, you know you're gonna use him 10 to 15 times a year, probably. So you just gotta roll with it. Uh I, I do believe in Lynn, but um yeah, I'm also ready for disappointment. So I'm with you there. And Sonny Gray is pretty, pretty dang good what he pulled off there now that he, you know he gets out of New York and actually used that sweeper they developed this past year that was phenomenal. And if he can keep building on that, then stand back and I see how that plays out. Detroit Tigers, we've got a couple more to talk about here. Kenta Maeda signed with the Detroit Tigers, which is a bit surprising to me for the fact that 104 innings last year, didn't pitch in 2022, 106 innings in 21, 66 innings in 20, and this is the Detroit Tigers team that has Tariq Skubal, who everyone loves, but innings could be a concern there. Matt Manning, Reese, Olding, Reese Olsen, and Casey Mize coming back from his surgery. So innings are a conundrum in Detroit, and Kenta Maeda doesn't really fill that problem. But I guess all things considered, ADP of around 255. So how do you like Kenta Maeda? See, I'm in, and I think it's because I, I buy into what we saw the second half of last year. The 71 innings in the second half, we saw a 3.79 ERA with underlying metrics that suggest it's pretty legitimate. I mean, depending on what you look at, the Sierra is 3.71, but the XFIP is 3.96. But he's going to a ballpark with a favorable, you know, home run dimensions and all that. So, and it's a team in the Tigers that, like it or not, I think are improving. We saw them kind of do decent last year. And I don't think they need him to go 200 innings. I think they can get 130, 140 out of him, 150. And if you're giving me a 1.12 whip, uh, like a 20 ish percent K minus walk rate and a sub four ERA. I'm okay with that being my SP six, especially in a 15 and a 12. He's probably a streamer. So uh, I like my a lot. And I think th- this bumps out Sawyer Gibson long, but that gives you, that gives them depth. They also have Jackson Job now who I don't think comes up right away because maybe that's what this move was, was to kind of give them a way to kind of wait on Job, maybe not exhaust his, uh, not exhaust his, his uh, rookie eligibility, maybe they give him a little more run. I mean, he's 21 years old, only pitched a whole six innings in double A. So I can easily see them. I can see Job coming up. He's being, Job's being drafted. I think Job could be more likely to be a end of the year type of call up, assuming that he does well, or unless the team's competing. But I think Job's the type of guy that gets a cup of coffee this year, comes up early next year or right away next year, and is one of those guys that they maybe try to, like, hey, look, we have a rookie of the year candidate and try to get that comp pick. So. Uh, I think Maeda is a fill gap uh, player with Sir Gibson Long now kind of gaining the shaft. And Gibson Long will definitely be the next guy up and probably find his way into 100 plus innings just because yeah. of basically need there, you know? Yeah, the Gibson Long is the big takeaway for me because, yeah, it, it might actually deplete his draft costs because he mm-hmm. gets pushed back here. But, you know, ADP of 300, I like just for the fact that I, those names I mentioned, like Casey Mice coming off his surgery, how much has he really got? Matt Manning can't stay healthy. I love resources. Well, all these guys have like issues. That's the <laughs> the thing. So, like yeah. even Miami, he'll find a, an IL stunt at some point. Like it's just what he's going to do. So between it all, Sawyer gets long. I think is. Uh, I know, like we talk about it a lot. I talk about it here. I talk about Ryan is when, when you're doing these drafts. Like who's the sixth man in like all these rotations, and which teams have a sixth man that can flourish. Gibson Long could be that dude. He could be one of the better ones in, in all of baseball. When we talk draft price and everything, so. I like him a lot. ADP around 300. I think that'll drop as uh since like his he's gone as low as 357. So I think there's definitely some uh, some weight that can drop him even more as news comes out in Detroit. 
Oh, and for what's worth, uh, remember how you talked about the Red Sox dealing, maybe how uh, a report dropped while you're podcasting about how the Red Sox will be, quote, aggressive in search of rotation upgrades. So I don't think they're going to be trading away rotation pieces. So maybe they're sticking a second base in house. That'll be a, or, or they'll go sign someone else that's or, out there. Who knows? Uh, I mean, they maybe, or maybe they do make a, maybe they sign somebody and then like, all right, cool, we'll trade Whitlock or we'll trade yeah. Cutter Crawford or exactly. Howard. That's I think that's still maybe, on maybe the table. Because I think India is just such a good fit in, in Boston, but maybe I'm just overexcited about Jonathan India, which is always a scary predicament. I was um, last year, and this year the price is like the same, if not cheaper, and I'm, I haven't been back in. I think it's because I don't trust him to stay in in. If, if he can't stay in Cincinnati, I don't know if I want him unless yeah. I'm building for like decent batting average, some speed that I think he's going to, you know, it is what it is. I think he'll be okay. I think it'll be a solid piece, but I think it's one of those things where I don't, how much, what does he go to a team that runs as much? Does he go to a team where he hits as high in the lineup and does India end up losing too much power production, leaving that park? So the price, I think the price makes sense because there's so much apprehension, but if you get half a season in Grand America small park, that's still probably worth where he's going. And I got it. I, it's one of those things where that's why I draft early because it gets my brain thinking of all these things. And I start reassessing and I'm like, all right, maybe I'll get on a couple of teams. Cause I, you know, I draft enough quantity. I, I think I do a total of nine between like DCs. I'm going to do six this year. I decided and three gladiators and then my two mains. So that's not quant. That's not like a high volume drafter per se, but that's a lot of leagues for a lot for most people. So, yeah. well, my, my thing with India is yeah. Great American small parks. Great. But if he stays in Cincinnati, He's not going to be playing every day. People think he is, but he's not because there's just so many mouths to feed. Where if he goes to a Boston or somewhere else that needs a second baseman, he plays every day. So is it the quality over quantity question? What's wrong with India? What do you prefer? And that's where I think it gets a little interesting, but that'll be something we can decide on a, a later date and time. All right, we have a couple more here before we have to head on out for the show. The New York Mets have made some noise, and it's not the noise New York Mets fans are hoping for because when they have a billion-dollar owner who has failed in a couple seasons of trying, he's becoming cheap this year, and they've been very vocal about that. And it just happens to be some of the best high-priced people out there to pay for. So it's fun in Queens right now. We'll start with Luis Severino, who signed with the New York Mets on a one-year deal. Um, Severino has an ADP of around 321 right now. Threw 89 innings for the Yankees last year with a 6.65 ERA, threw 102 innings in 2022. Obviously, bad 2021 coming off or rough after an injury riddle 2020. All in all, though, Severino's never been really a guy for me. Strikeouts dropped a ton last year. It was a home run derby at most times, but it's always been a home run issue for me with Severino. Some are very optimistic about Severino with the Mets, some are not. I am not one of them. What are your thoughts on Luis Severino? I just don't know what to expect. Back to back seasons of 89 innings or 102 innings or less. So obviously he's probably not going to pitch a whole lot of innings. And at that, the strikeouts haven't been there the last two years either. Um, injuries have played a part. I don't have a whole lot of optimism here personally. I think everyone's dreaming on the guy that was pitching 190 innings plus back to back seasons in New York and, you know, putting up the really strong numbers. And could he get back to? Close, somewhat of that maybe I, I don't know i'm not i don't i i, I got nothing here i, I want to find reasons for optimism but it's just hard when there really isn't any yeah, i'm not <laughs> seeing it like yeah. I'll, i'm fine i've said it many times on my shows and i'm and fine being proven wrong do the pitch is great congratulations do the mets are the mets known for fixing pitching all of a sudden no they're, they're known for il stints that's what they've always yeah i know they i know they've revamped their whole situation there so but still, it's one of those things where, like, I can't, like, Doug, uh, was it, uh, Doug, uh, what's his face, or Peterson, whatever his name is, David Peterson, David Peterson. not Doug Peterson, wrong sport, David Peterson, uh, McGill, those guys never really panned out, even though they both showed flashes, and it's like, this is the same team that's bringing on a guy that has shown flashes and hasn't had it going for the last couple of years. It's a one-year deal. I think it's a great. I think it's a good real life move. I just it's don't a know. Great if, real life move because what do you have to lose? But, but yeah. fantasy wise, I, I just I can't see myself buying in, and I, I'm with you. If I miss out, I miss out. But it's one of those things where it's two straight seasons of showing mediocrity or worse. I and health issues, and I just have a hard time suddenly saying, you know what? And now if he comes out in spring, he's throwing harder, he's and he's looking really good. Sure, I can I just like anyone else, I'll adapt my thinking. But right now, sitting here in December, I don't see a true path to that guy coming back. Nope, I'm with you. Like I'll be proven wrong. That's fine. Uh, they also signed utility man Joey Wendell, which you know, I got McNeil. Amazing. You have you have um Lindor, like the, the, the infield's pretty much locked in. 
So this is a super utility guy. I have mm-hmm. really no interest in him until someone gets hurt. What about you? No, even when someone gets hurt, you can keep him. Um, he's just, he's just, he's um, what's his face, Giorme type of guy, where he's just gonna kind of fill in as needed. He was a more reason. expensive Giorme. That's what one Mets fan on Twitter was very angry That's about. Like, just, we could have kept Giorme for cheaper. What are we doing right now? <laughs> yeah, Wendell isn't. Wendell was like two years ago. Wendell was kind of like a good like utility guy, and then last year for the Marlins, he was so just whatever. And I think his days of playing shortstop are kind of behind him too. So I mean, he could fill in a pinch, but. I don't know what what are they doing. He's a super util. Maybe it was Giorme a lefty because maybe not. And with Wendell being a lefty, maybe they prefer the lefty utility the guy more. Lefty, doors a switch hitter, so maybe for third base. Well, and they have Beatty for third base and Mauricio, who's yeah, a sw- switch hitter. Oh, it's yeah. like- <laughs> and Mauricio's a switch hitter. Something like what? Like, I thought maybe 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 the lefty bat was the deal. It was the tiebreaker there. But oh. even then, they don't really necessarily. They have Vientos as righty off the bench. They have plenty of options. They don't need Wendell. I guess Wendell. I don't know. He's a, he's still a serviceable utility guy. I'm not saying he's a bad player. Yeah, but I don't think he. I think it's. I just don't see. I, he's I'm probably surprised. an upgrade from Guillerme, but not a gigantic upgrade worth doing. This is the thing. I just. I thought it wasn't. Wasn't he? Uh, wasn't that his the glove was the thing for Guillermo? Guillermo, yeah. whatever his last name was. Yeah. I'm awful. I'm awful. All right. The last move I have written down here because really nothing else has taken place is the Los Angeles Dodgers re-signed Jason Hayward. And some may be bummed out about that, but in the grand scheme of things, Jason Hayward has been. Weirdly serviceable is what I'll say. He hit 269 last year with 15 overs and two steals in 124 games. Like that's platoon bat worthy. And with the news of Mookie Betts playing every day at second base now, that makes even more sense to bring back Hayward on the cheap because you have Outman who should play every day in center field. You have Hayward platooning in, in right, and you have Chris Taylor or someone else coming into the outfield and left. Um, what's your whole take on this Dodgers thing? I know like the Betts second base, you have Hayward in the outfield. How do you see that all this playing out? And Hayward, by real quick, before I uh, really give you the floor here, Hayward has an ADP of 687. I think that's going to go back up now that he re-signed. But even then, it's still going to be reserve round worthy. Uh, he'll be a guy that you should be like, – we're, we're in a draft together. I guarantee you we're both going to be tar- targeting him. It's not really a secret just because he has – Valuable at bats. I mean, if you get a week, if you get get him on a week with seven righties, he's probably playing. He'll probably play six of them at least, right? Yep. So you know you're getting playing time there. And we saw how good he was last year. He was kind of all intents and purposes back. I mean, best barrel rate of his career. The hard hit rate was like was whatever, but the fact that he like he had like a eight percent barrel rate, which is almost double his best season. Almost, it's just crazy what they did. They were able to fix him a little bit. I think he pulled the crap out of the ball in the air too. It was kind of a big thing for him. Anyway, yeah, he pulled the ball really well, elevated it decently. Anyway, so uh, Hayward, I think the problem is, I think what either it's going to suppress the price of Vargas or it's actually going to hinder the production of Vargas. Because Vargas is kind of like the guy that like everyone, because, you know, there's already talking about how Vargas is going to get time in the outfield. And now that was before. Now they, you know, this report came out about Betts being the second baseman, which only secures Vargas to an outfield spot. So if you get Vargas in a draft, if he assuming that he actually, you know, fights and breaks camp, he's going to get outfield eligibility. So keep that in mind. But Vargas is a guy that I, I don't understand what, how I got that wrong, so wrong. <laughs> like, I really you liked were, You weren't alone. I wasn't I, on I Vargas. Really there was a lot of very, very smart people that were I really liked them. in line with you. But like the Bush Vargas thing, if they have and talent. Well, Bush, that, Bush is know. just never going to play. I don't care if he's show, either showing him at DH right now. I don't, at this point, I don't believe them ever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe him, but it's one of those things where it's like, uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, but I think Vargas would be like, like maybe our Vargas is fighting for a spot. But we saw, we've seen how heavy this team likes to platoon. So Vargas being a righty that could hurt him. But is Chris Taylor really more than a platoon bat right now? They have Chris Taylor slotted in at left field and Russell resource. And I don't know if I buy that because we've seen we've seen uh, Taylor even with opportunities to be a full time starter not get that type of run anymore. So I don't know. If he would get that shot over Vargas, which, which Vargas almost like last year, where they say, hey, Vargas, you're the guy. And they gave him that spot from the, from go, and then injury happened and underperformance, et cetera. But could they be like, hey, Varg- Vargas, you're the guy again, but you're in the outfield now. And yeah. Taylor just fills in as needed. And if he fails in the outfield, then Varg- then uh, Taylor steps in. So I think Vargas, if I had to bet on anybody losing player time, I think Chris Taylor, honestly, I'd be more likely to fade Taylor than Vargas. But that's it's my just weird. It's just weird how they like Taylor so much. That's just always been I, a thing. But if you look at it, last and, year, and you, Taylor, still, and you have Andy. I always call him Pages. I believe it's something else. Uh, oh, that's all I was looking at too. I was looking at Pages. So he's I, a talented dude that's just knocking on the door to get a chance to play the outfield. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think this team's obviously, and then once it, if they get Otani, then that changes a lot of things too, because then Bush is out of the DH spot. I don't think they're done making moves well, either via trade or like well, I can see I can see Tyler O'Neill ending up here type of thing. You know, Dave Roberts already said if uh, they don't get Otani, they're gonna go after JD Martinez to come back in DH. Oh, maybe and JD's probably waiting for Otani to see where he yeah, can go to see what the market looks like. Obviously, he's not getting five hundred million dollars. At least he has an idea because. Uh, Justin Turner and JD Martinez are looking for the same type situation. So, but JD, the the Dave Roberts exact quotes was, "If we don't sign our, if we or when we don't, so whatever." He had some, "If we don't sign Otani," comment, then we will go hard after JD Martinez. So. Yeah, and that makes sense. But either way, so like Bush goes back to being unless Bush gets traded, he's kind of the odd man out again for DH, and then and then that's why I think I honestly wouldn't be surprised if this team's like, all right, cool, so we don't get Otani, let's go ahead and. Make some trades, make some moves. They can, they could. There, this is a perfect team to go out and get a Tyler O'Neill. See what you got, see what they have out of them. O'Neill would upgrade the outfit, outfield defense as well, probably. While also a team like this, it would be the ideal situation for him. They'll start over low, stre- low pressure because he's coming to a situation where he's not the star, not even the bigger one of the bigger names on this team. I think O'Neill could honestly get some run and figure it out with a team like the Dodgers. And I hate to give the Dodgers. Yeah, I'm sorry for your, you know, your Giants, but I'm used to it. Is what it is, but I think it's a team like so. Uh, I, I think O'Neill gets dealt in the first place. would be so. great there. Maybe it's really just one of the things where the Dodgers could use outfield, and this is one of the few. T- you know what? Here's a team that has pitching that they could deal probably. Yep. They could deal go. and figure things out. Though, Sheehan, probably. Stone. I Kirk. watched them. Watch them go trade for Jonathan India. And now Betts is back to the outfield. After all those reports, <laughs> no, India would India would play first base somehow. Remember, because India is awful defensively too. That's, That's another true. thing. He's That's awful. True. And who's their second baseman? No bets. That's right. Yeah. So, um, Freddie Freeman's at first. That ain't happening. Yeah. That's a, it was one of those things where like, they can go out there and get Fraley, get another left hand because Fraley was actually a plus defender in the corners, too. That'd be interesting. Well, lots more moves to come. One more move that will not take place was announced during the show as we recorded as the Angels came out and said vehemently that Mike Trout will not be traded this offseason. I still believe things when I see it. But uh, I think it's more that no one was willing to take on the contract that they signed him to, and that's kind of that's why he was always going to be difficult to trade to begin with. But uh, we'll see what else shakes out here. As it's uh, Tuesday of the winter meetings, we saw the rest of the week to go. Whoa, Everyone's whoa, saying show Hale sign. They're saying all these guys will take place before it's all said and done. But Mr. Curlin, how dare you? How dare you just not talk about the lead? Barry the lead. I tweeted out before this podcast about how the Rockies are focused on pitching help and bench upgrades, as if their starting as if their starting lineup isn't a bunch of bench players. They want to upgrade the bench, though. Don't worry. Uh, I don't care about anything. The I, Rockies do. I just thought I just thought I'd mention like that's what they're focused on: pitching help yeah. and bench upgrades. That's why bench a lot upgrades. of things said at the winter meetings take with a grain of salt. Like, would, it, would I be shocked if Trout's traded tomorrow? Probably not. But I got. I also would be shocked if he traded. Period. I think it's just too difficult to trade a player like Mike Trout. That's just gonna be very, very, very complicated to pull off. But any final thoughts, Mister Curlin, as we keep uh, plodding on here in the off season to get ready for twenty twenty four? No, that's it. Just gonna be churning out content left and right. Got some stuff in the works as always. But I'm definitely scaling back and focusing more on being a player this year. Um, as long as you're obviously, I have no problem being your co-host in season or whenever you need me in the off season because I love talking baseball. Even and I gotta get better. I gotta get better again, man. I can't be making these rookie <laughs> mistakes, you know. But we'll have you back as usual. Uh, I kind of sprinkle in other people here and there, but I will have you back for sure. And the end season content will likely stay the same as long as the schedules line up. So we will uh, see where things go, but make sure you follow Mike on Twitter at Mike underscore Curlin. MLB playingtime.com is where you can get all the information there. He admitted to me before the show he's horrible at marketing, so I'll take care of it for him. Well, also, what are the odds that lasts more than a year? Let's be honest. Oh, I'm, <laughs> but I'm, you're giving it longer than I thought. I'm just well, I, I paid for a year, so it gets a year. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be up. It'll be active for a year. Content-wise, up to debate, but it'll be active for a year. Yes. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at BDNTrick, my sub stack. Just search KC Bubba on the sub stack or follow my Twitter. It's right there. Um, so check all that stuff out. But until next time, This was Bench with Bubba, episode 614, recapping some of the MLB hot stove with Mike Curlin. Catch you all later.